Listeners, readers, welcome to the Foxed page where we dive deep into the very best books. If it sounds a little bit echoey to you uh, when you're hearing this, that is because I am coming to you from the bathroom. I am sitting on the toilet right now. It's a closed toilet and I am fully dressed, uh, as you can see if you're watching this on YouTube. But I'm coming to you from the bathroom because today uh, we're going to talk about some things that are fairly intimate, fairly private, and extremely important. I'm also enjoying being in this bathroom in particular because I love this wallpaper. I got it from Anthropology like 3,000 years ago, but I'm gonna bring it here so you guys can check it out. So it's um, it's the most incredible stuff. It's stitched onto the wall. So it's like this beautiful creamy paper and then this is this font, which is incredible. Look at this typeface. Um, it is Shakespeare. It is from Midsummer Night's Dream. And what I love is that Puck and Fairy are you know highlighted every once in a while um but it's excellent because when you walk in the bathroom your brain does this thing where you start saying fuck because of puck and fairy like you mix them up a little bit and um it's it's really delightful i love everything about it today we are going to talk about a book called ejaculate responsibly a whole new way to think about abortion this is incredibly important, people. This book is very uh, attractive. It has this very cool thing where all of the pages, um, you know, the kind of middle of the pages where the pages come together are red, which is just like really kind of uh, interesting and, and awesome. It also is quick. You have entire pages that are filled um, with these giant red and black letters saying important things like, we need to shift our focus to men. So this is a book by Gabrielle Blair, who is design mom. For those of you who are, you know, savvy about social media, Gabrielle Blair, I've been watching forever. She's so inspirational to me. She is a woman who began a design blog in like 2006 or something, right in the kind of wilds of blogging and has been incredibly successful since then. She has like a zillion followers. I'm not sure exactly how many. And her focus really has been design. But at one point she wrote uh, on Twitter a, an essay about the fact that men are essentially the causes of all unwanted pregnancies, which this letter then caused a real stir on Twitter and ended up, um, from what I can understand, becoming this very important book, Ejaculate Responsibly. Today, I'm just gonna touch on a few of the uh, arguments that she makes here that seem so important to me and so logical and so cogent and so well defended and well argued. And um, I'm gonna touch on them. I'm gonna add my own little spin to a couple of them. Some of you who've been following the Fox page for a long time or have gone to my lectures at the bookstore know um, that once upon a time I wrote a book in 2008, which was like a zillion years ago, I wrote a book called Hump. I literally can't remember the subtitle. It's right here. Hump, True Tales of Sex After Kids, uh, which essentially was, it was a celebration of monogamy. I like to really underscore that. And it um, also, it just was, you know, how to keep your sex life alive when you have small children in your house. No mean feat. Lots of jokes being made at that point, like, oh, is your book four pages long? You know, because essentially, the idea is that you have no sex life after you have children. But in fact, um, you know, the book was a normal length. It was, I don't know, 300 pages or something. And um, so I did kind of dip my toe into some, uh, into the world of ejaculation. I did, I dipped a toe. But I will say here that um, Gabrielle Blair, had I read this book before I wrote mine, there would have been some real changes. Um, I have to say in revisiting a couple of things, I, I stand by the pros in my book. I really, um, you know, my memory, you guys all know that I have a terrible, terrible memory. It was as if I was reading uh, prose that was about and by someone completely different. And um, I have to say, I was not, I was not uh, off put by the prose. I did not read a lot of it. I just read the chapters, um, that, well, I just skimmed them, frankly, the chapters that would be important today, given our topic. And I can tell you that those two chapters in particular would have been significantly different had I read Gabrielle's amazing book. This could not come at a more important time. I actually don't, I mean, the book must have been written before Roe was overturned, but I would um, add to the many excellent arguments in the book here that um, there is no time that has been more urgent than now when uh, you know abortion is really being very seriously threatened 
in, in all sorts of states around our crazy country, um, it, it, you know, this is a very, very important time to do some rethinking about uh, abortion. So we're gonna dive in here. Uh, again, ejaculate responsibly, a whole new way to think about abortion. So she has some stuff at the beginning, but we're just gonna dive in uh, to this first statement that she makes. I love how bold her, her statements are and also how bold the font is. I mean, this is a really excellent, it's an excellent font, it's an, but more importantly, I really appreciate the content. A crucial refocus, it's the men. So at the heart of Gabrielle, um, oh, Gabrielle Blair. Wow, I keep thinking of Gabrielle Zevin, which is, that's a nice mistake to be making. Uh, Gabrielle Zevin having written tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Gabrielle Blair is um, really arguing that in fact, when we are thinking about pregnancy and when we are thinking about abortion and birth control, we really need to have the men at the center of a conversation that is absolutely, an, and a practice that is absolutely dominated by women. So again, the very first idea is we need to refocus on the men. The men need to be at the center of this. Okay, so she actually has two really great um, you know, uh, chapters. One is about sperm and one is about eggs. And the idea is that men are fertile all the time. You know, They can ejaculate many times a day. They are always fertile. Whereas women are um, you know, essentially going to great, great lengths with our birth control in order to sort of safeguard you know, five days of our cycle when our egg might be, I mean, the egg is really only fertilizable. I don't think fertilizable is a word. It's really only um, fertilizable for, for a, like a 24 hour window, but you know, sperm can live for some amount of time. So she makes some really good arguments about sort of basic biological stuff about the fact that in, in essence, men are much more fertile than women are which, you know, it doesn't take a, a, you know, a huge leap to then understand that men should perhaps be shouldering a bit more of the responsibility for fertility. And then um, she gets to uh, this number five chapter, which is really, I think, one of the, it's where the arguments sort of really begin to sing for me. And th these are the arguments, again, that I have been um, really talking up with anyone who will listen. This one is called Birth control is hard to access and hard to use. And I'm gonna read some stuff verbatim just because again, I think that she does such a good job. But before I do that, I'm gonna say that at 53 years old, uh, I have been, you know, the purveyor. No, not the purveyor. I'm, I don't think I've ever, ah! I actually have been a purveyor of birth control in the sense that I have provided it for um, actually some of my peers when I was back in high school because my parents were very open-minded and very progressive and um, you know very pro birth control. So we actually, you know, I took a couple couple friends to Planned Parenthood. I myself had access to um, you know many different in a wealth of privilege, many different options, and all were easily accessible. And I had parents who you know asked if I needed birth control and took me to the clinic and did all this stuff. Um, I have used condoms. I have used a diaphragm. Uh, I have been on the pill for different times. I've had three different IUDs. Actually, I've had five attempts at insertion of IUDs. The first two were totally botched and totally painful. Like we're talking days and days and days of pain. And each of them cost easily $700 for the, um, for the actual IUD that they were unable to insert that they just tossed in the trash can that I had to pay for. I also had to pay for the appointment that was covered by ins uh, insurance, but the, the, you know, the failed apparatus, the tiny little plastic thing that no one seemed to be able to get up through my cervix into my uterus, that thing went in the trash and cost me a total of $1,400. And this was a long time ago. And then I had three IUDs. So, um, I mean, I, I say, I list all of those things. I talk about those totally painful, you know, awful attempts at IUD insertion, but I will say, then I am someone who feels like birth control has been e really easy actually to manage. I haven't had many side effects. My birth control has been very effective. Um, it has been easy to access because I am someone who is, you know, very uh, in touch with my doctors and in touch with my body. And I have the financial privileges to be able to seek, um, you know, medical treatment and to be able to drive myself to the doctor and to be able to manage, you know, all sorts of different uh, interfaces with medical offices. So I am someone for whom, you know, many different types of birth control have been in play and yet all of them, um, you know, have been very satisfying. The reason I say that 
is because I really feel very fortunate. What Gabrielle is arguing here, in fact, that it is very difficult to, uh, you know, to get birth control, and it's also really difficult to use. So I'm gonna, um, you know, again, my story made it sound like I was really lucky, but also it was a total hassle. I mean, I was willing to do it and I was happily doing it and I was doing it in a very privileged fashion, but it was not as easy as buying condoms at the corner store. So um, we have Gabrielle here telling us and, and reminding us of the fact that, you know, if you are a woman who doesn't have a car or is working two jobs or is not very comfortable, you know, just heading right into your primary physician and asking for a pelvic exam and asking for birth control, that was all, it was all very easy for me, but those are enormous hurdles for many people. Um, and then she goes on to say that not only is it difficult to access birth control, but that in fact, a lot of women's birth control is very difficult to use. I have a very good friend who is uh, going to be a senior in college and she does a lot of work in human-centered design. And she recently uh, invented this incredible thing, which is a piece of jewelry, it's very attractive, that you can wear and inside it is a, like a little secret box. So you can keep, this is the important part, you can keep a couple of your birth control pills in there in case you end up staying um, you know, at a friend's house, you end up going on a fun road trip all of a sudden, you forget your you know, little packet of pills at home. This is, this is a, um, a very handy and I think a very kind of generous invention that she's come up with. But when you look at the subtext of that, it's actually pretty crazy because if you are a young woman, who is extremely fertile, as all college students are, um, you know, you have to take that pill every single day and you have to take it at the same time. I mean, it is a huge burden. It might mean that you get a really cute piece of jewelry that's very like innovative and design friendly, but like men aren't having to do that. They aren't having to think about how they're gonna have their birth control with them if they happen to spend over at, at a girlfriend's house or a boy's house or wherever. So. Um, all of that is to say that even when we think of birth control as being easy and handy and effective, it really is a very large burden. There also is this, and I'm going to read a little bit of, uh, of Gabrielle's book here. The list of side effects for the pill, patch, ring, shot is long and serious, including depression, fatigue, headache, insomnia, mood swings, nausea, breast pain, vomiting, weight gain, acne, bloating, blood clots, heart attack, high blood pressure, liver cancer, and stroke. Also, depending on where a woman is in her menstrual cycle, it can take two to seven days before the effectiveness even kicks in. So you can't fill a prescription and be instantly protected. I mean, guess what you can be instantly protected with? A condom. And for those of you right now who are like, oh my God, wait, condoms are terrible. Just hold your hat because uh, I have some thoughts on that via, well, the thoughts are going to be via me. They're Gabrielle's thoughts and they're excellent. Okay, so the point being that, that these, even if you feel like your birth control is relatively easy to access and, you know, you've had relatively good experiences with it, it's still, you know, there's a really long list of side effects um, that, that it, even if you aren't saddled with many of these, there is sort of a specter and some of them are very serious, in fact. Okay, um, she then goes on to talk about how men, for birth control for men, is in fact easy to access and to use. So I'm gonna read slightly at length here because she makes the arguments so well. Men have two options for birth control, condoms and vasectomies. Both are easier, cheaper, more convenient, and safer than birth control options for women. Condoms are sold in every grocery store, every pharmacy, every bodega, every gas station, every 7-Eleven. There are condom vending machines at nightclubs and in public bathrooms. They are available to purchase 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They might be the most easily accessible product in the whole country. So, you know, part of you is like, okay, yeah, right. I see them at the gas stations and I see them at the, you know, whatever. And I actually had a friend recently who has a, a son in college and we were discussing like CVS and self-checkout. If you're a young man, you don't even have to talk to anyone. You know, you can just grab yourself some condoms and just do your own self-checkout. And I mean, it could not be easier compared again with a surgical procedure like tubal ligation or, you know, terribly painful insertions of IUDs. By the way, the IUD thing got much better 
for me and for many, many people. And I'm really happy about the number of younger people who are having IUDs um, put in because it's a very effective birth control. Of course, they should also be using uh, condoms for STIs. And I'm gonna make a tiny insertion here and I might be totally off on this. I might be really naive, but I do think that um, the younger generation, the non 50 year olds are maybe a little bit better um, about using condoms. I don't know, that might be totally not true, but my sense is that um, they're, they're at least, uh, my hope, oh my God, I hope. Um, my hope is that in fact, um, with you know, with a little bit more knowledge about all of these things and a little bit more openness and in this age of, of more consent, um, I am hopeful that in fact, there is more respect and more um, you know, acceptance of condom use. So Gabrielle goes on and says a few more things. Condoms are affordable, condoms are convenient, condoms come in lots of varieties. Condoms make cleanup super easy. This kind of made me laugh. So she said, condoms keep all the semen in one convenient little sack, which means semen won't get on bedding or clothing and won't drip from the woman's body as she waddles to the bathroom. Bonus. This is what Gabrielle says, and I really did enjoy that. Um, I don't, I, I, I mean, that wouldn't be one of my main reasons to use a condom, but she is not wrong. I mean, it, yes. All of that, all of that is true. Waddling to the bathroom, you're not gonna, um, you know, if it's all in a little condom, you're not gonna have to worry about what's dripping down your legs. Okay, um, she also says condoms are only used as needed, which is extremely important when you compare it to, um, you know, the long list of side effects for something like the pill, um, or, or even a diaphragm, which is just not, it's, um, you know, it's only used as needed, but it takes a lot, but it, you know, it's more forethought, and then it also is, um, you know, you have to leave that in there for a long time, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, this is a very salient part of her argument. She says, finally, condoms work. When used correctly, condoms are 98% effective at preventing pregnancy. And not just that, condoms have double superpowers. They can prevent pregnancy and they can prevent sexually transmitted infections, STIs. Those of you out there who are still saying STD, um, or God forbid, VD, Remember when it was venereal disease? I mean, what the, what the, what? Um, but those of you who are still saying STD, it is not disease. The, a disease is not, um, well, an infection is generally something that is curable and it's something that, you know, you can solve uh, medically fairly easily. A, a disease is something that is, I think, more chronic and uh, maybe a little more intractable. So, um, but she, I mean, what an excellent point. Yes, they're 98% effective at, uh, you know, uh, preventing pregnancy. They also will prevent STIs. Women's birth control options do not have the same STI fighting superpower. This is extremely important. If you're not in a monogamous relationship, then it's extremely, extremely important to be, um, you know, safeguarding against STIs. And why not also have your birth control taken care of at the same time? She goes on to say, what condoms do not have is a list of side effects. They don't cause depression, mood swings, blood clots, liver failure, weight gain, acne, strokes, or anything else on the list of side effects for hormonal birth control. I mean, that is a pretty good argument. So again, um, those of you who are my age are thinking to yourselves like, oh my God, yeah, but like, condoms are terrible. Like nobody likes condoms. Condoms are just like, ugh, you know, who does that? But she goes on to make another excellent argument, which is that if men take even just a little bit of time, like not even that much time. And I mean, who is sad about practicing uh, birth control and methods by having sex? Probably no one. Uh, but if men take the time to figure out which condoms are right for them, you know, which size or what they like or different materials or, you know, whatever it is or different lubrication, they, you know, do a little experimenting. Um, she says this, successful condom users report that once they solved the size, materials, and lubrication questions, they could barely tell the difference between sex with a condom and sex without. Again, if women are expected to learn how to use their birth control correctly, the same can be expected of men. So important. I mean, again, for a woman to learn how to use a diaphragm, um, that it's not that easy. I mean, it's not that hard, but like, it's really not that easy. And especially for someone who is a little bit less comfortable about like putting her fingers up her vagina, like that's, you know, this can be a tricky thing. For men, on the other hand, I mean, men are also, I think, much more comfortable handling their penises, but you know, you can spend some time figuring this out 
And in fact, um, she makes a very good point that once men like admit the fact that you just have to figure it out, all, you know, everyone, she, not everyone, but she said hundreds of men have, have told her in fact, that once you figure it out, it's really not, not even detectable, like not noticeable. This is where we get to the argument that I think is the very, very best argument in the book. And it's the one um, that I think we need to discuss most, that we need to be talking about. It is this, the idea that society clings to the idea that men hate condoms. So again, even when I first started reading the book and I realized that she was going to start arguing condoms, even I, as like a progressive woman who has thought a lot about this topic was like, oh my God, yeah, but condoms are apparently are terrible. Like I'm acting like they're like the worst thing ever because I have been so conditioned to think that. But she goes on to say the following. We've been told in books, in movies, in memes, that it doesn't feel as good to have sex without a condom, meaning it doesn't feel as good for men. What it feels like for their partner doesn't enter the discussion. So she's gonna go on in a bit and talk about how the way that we think about sex is too focused on men's pleasure. But at this point, she is still talking just mostly about the condoms. Again, this book is so well argued. I mean, it is very orderly and very well organized and very cogent and co coherent and, and it, it's, it's very impressive. So we're in the condom zone here, not the pleasure zone quite so much yet. So she goes on a little bit to talk about this kind of macho stereotype that I myself, um, as, as like a, feminist liberated you know woman at 53 years old having grown up in california and having written a book about sex and parenting um i still had this idea that like i don't know that condoms were literally the worst she goes on to say the stereotype of men trying to avoid using condoms is basically a given in our culture the why behind the stereotype sometimes feels innocent but other times it can be upsetting some men describe feeling like it's a conquest to convince a woman not to use a condom. And conversely, some men describe feeling less manly if they can't convince a woman to let them forego the condom. And I really think that, I think there's really an enormous amount of truth there, that there's like a manly thing here. There's like a macho thing. So um, we're gonna go on, Gabrielle quotes a, um, a man that she was, essentially when she was researching the book, someone she was talking to, he says this. There is some truth to the idea of sex with a condom being less fun, but it's because condoms require practice. Men who have practiced using condoms and experimented with different varieties and use lubrication know that condoms don't diminish their pleasure during sex in any significant way. This is like the secret, you know, it's like the secret that these men have. She does in fact mention that, um, you know, one of her concerns is we don't talk about this enough. And also that men who have had success with condoms might not be as vocal and as out front with it because of this yucky, like manly macho thing where like condoms are sort of lame and you're somehow less than or you're less virile or you're less macho um, if you are in fact, you know, not able to talk a woman out of having sex without condoms, which just sounds absurd when I say it. She goes on and says, I have heard variations on this from hundreds of men whenever I host conversations online about this topic. Okay. This is when I'm gonna just bust into um, my own book for just one minute. So this is the book that I wrote. It's called Hump, True Tales of Sex After Kids. And um, I actually, for those of you on YouTube, I just wanna show you, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, and it actually is, is sort of weirdly uh, germane because the what I'm holding up in my hand, for those of you who are only listening, is a copy of my book that came with the very first print run but it um, is a very cool cover actually that says 50 years from the front line of Magnum. And it's a, um, essentially they put the wrong cover on my book, which we thought was funny because if you were like embarrassed to carry a book around called Hump, um, you could carry this book around that says Magnum instead on the front. And it's like black and white and gray. And I think this is a picture by Frank Kappa. It's, it's a, and there's a picture maybe here. I think this is a soldier from the Spanish Civil War. It's like very like tough looking photos, but also Magnum, of course, as being um, a, a brand of condom. So I, I really think in some ways that this was some sort of weird cosmic thing where a very macho uh, condom naming um, magazine 
that doesn't make sense, but I think you know what I'm saying here, um, was, was by accident made a cover of my book. So there you go. Never seen before outside of my family. Um, but what I want to say about my book is I had two chapters in my book that were very specifically about birth control and they were specifically about men's birth control. And I think of them actually as like, um, you know, sort of companion pieces because they were called snip and snap. They were kind of these cute, cute chapters, you know, with an exclamation mark, snip and snap. Snip was about vasectomy and snap was about failed condoms. So I can tell you if I had this book to write over again, these two chapters would have been different. So snip essentially was an amalgam of all of the men that I heard with all of their dumb stories about, you know, testicles swelling up to the size of grapefruits and how in the UK we had a friend who like, opened up his work locker and a bunch of little seedless um, like mandarins fell out because he'd gotten a vasectomy and he was like seedless. I mean, just all sorts of like dumb male stuff about like how awful it was and about how, you know, oh, you shouldn't do it and it's less manly, blah, 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 or you like can't get a boner, or, like whatever this stupid stuff was. So it, it was essentially an amalgam of all of those different things. But I will, um, I'm, I'm a little sad now that I didn't push it a little further. I like to think the subtext of that chapter, SNP, is that men are actually just scared and stupid about medical procedures. The point is, SNP, this chapter, was essentially, it, it, it was a send up of these men, but it also, I think, was a bit too apologetic and definitely let them off the hook too easily. SNAP was, um, you know, it was a collection of women who I know personally and who I interviewed who had gotten pregnant um, when a condom broke. And in those cases, you know, one did result in abortion, one ended up in a pregnancy that actually two ended up in pregnancies that were brought to full term that were fine and great. And those women are happy they have those kids, but they were certainly disruptive and they were certainly not, um, you know, just like joyous, um, you know, moments. So um, the only reason why I would hesitate now is because in writing that chapter is, is because I wouldn't want the only condom use in the book to be examples of condoms not working. And I will say right now that I do wonder how much of this is user error, you know? I mean, I'm just thinking that um, the people who are not using the, the condoms correctly, maybe they need to size up. I don't know, maybe they need better lube. Maybe they need to practice how to put it on. So again, I want to underscore Gabrielle's point, her really important statistic that 98% out of 100, that's not how you say that, but 98 out of 100 pregnancies will not occur. Also not a great way to say that. That if you have sex 100 times and you use the condom appropriately, only two, I'm not, you know what? I'm not even gonna do the math because I'm just not, it's not my forte. So. Gabrielle's point is that condoms are very effective and I hate to think that I sort of eroded that confidence in them. Um, but, but I like to also think maybe what I'm speaking to here is um, a sense of, um, of people maybe not having practiced enough. So one of the bottom lines here is people is, is practice with those condoms. Get out there and have some sex with condoms if you're doing that. Gabrielle, in fact, makes an important point about vasectomies. She says, Related myths about loss of manliness hover around the topic of vasectomies too. Many men worry that a vasectomy will risk messing up their erections or ejaculations. Men are concerned that they won't be able to perform after, the, after a vasectomy. Men are concerned that they won't be able to perform after a vasectomy and they'll be less virile. Because of this, in the United States, only 9% of men who are sexually active get vasectomies, but 27% of women who are sexually active get tubal ligations. So that's a crazy, that's a crazy statistic because, um, you know, a, a vasectomy is an outpatient thing. You're in and out in the morning. I don't even, I think they use local anesthetic. It's just really not that big a deal. Yes, you're on the couch maybe, you know, with a bag of peas. But whatever, you're sitting there watching television for a while. A tubal ligation is a, it's a, you know, an abdominal surgery that requires general anesthesia and is a much more invasive procedure. Um, and yet it's one more thing that women are saddled with. I loved this part of the book that I'm going to read right now. Um, this is from an anesthesiologist. I do anesthesia for a living. Done it for hundreds of tubals, I'm sure. Tubals being tubal ligation. I often think, what the fuck is wrong with this husband? 
Except when part of a C-section, tubules should be rare. Vasectomies are cheap, low pain, extremely safe, and highly effective. Why are tubules also a burden that women must carry? An additional point, there has never been a documented death from a vasectomy. However, many women have died from anesthetic or surgical complications from tubal ligations. Again, it seems so stark, and yet you have 9% of men having vasectomy and 24, 27% of women. What was that number? I'm going back to look. 27%, almost one third of women having tubal ligations. That is a, that is a statistic um, you know, that you should be trotting out anytime you get the chance to. I'm going to um, touch on two of the last arguments. Uh, the last one is the most uh, significant, I think, and that kind of my best argument that, I, that I've been really convincing people with. But um, I do want to touch on this one argument that she makes that really, I think, kind of, uh, you know, distills a lot of what we're saying in this book, which is, we don't mind if women suffer as long as it makes things easier for men. Now, some of you might be bridling at that, but honestly, there is a lot of truth there. I mean, women, when it comes to any kind of reproduction, women, you know, we're doing the suffering. It's just a fact. There's, you know, we are the ones who are pregnant, period. Like, oh, we are the ones who also have periods. I mean, it's just, it's a fact. I mean, dudes, wow, they owe us, you know, they owe us. They should just throw us a bone. Oh my God, as it were. Okay, but... Um, now we're going to get to what I think is the most kind of salient argument here, and it's the one that that, that really is very effective, which is, um, well, the kind of umbrella idea here is that society teaches that the man's pleasure is the purpose and priority of sex. Absolutely true. Um, I will say, I have noticed that there is a, a little shift. Um, just in the sense that women are talking more about masturbation, they're talking more about having vibrators, they're, um, women are, um, you know, I think you can buy a vibrator now everywhere. Like literally it used to, like all of a sudden they were showing up at Brookstone at the airport and everybody was like tittering. And now you can buy them at CVS and you know, they're all different kinds and they're all, you know, lots of them are, are sort of targeted toward women. I'm sure there's some pink tax where we have to pay more for a pink vibrator than like whatever men want. Um, but, but I am happy to see that because I do think that this discussion of masturbation and of vibrators is really um, is helping us understand that sex should be also about women's pleasure. I like to think also that some of the stuff with consent, um, which was not a thing when I was a young person, um, I like to think that also maybe that's helping to, to focus things a bit more on at least how a woman is feeling while having sex. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it helps out with issues of pleasure, but um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe this next generation is both slightly better about condom use and is also um, it is also just a little more tuned into the fact that pleasure should be had by both parties. But Gabrielle goes on to say the following. It's taken for granted that men will experience pleasure during these sexual interactions. Will women experience pleasure in the same interactions? Who knows? I love it. I mean, and again, sex is something that is very private. It is something that is not spoken about a lot. Even if people do talk about it, it tends to be in general terms. It's not so much like your own experiences. And, and that's appropriate in lots of ways. I also think it's great to talk about all sorts of things like that. Um, but she goes on to say, it doesn't come up, this idea of women's pleasure, because a woman's orgasm isn't an essential part of learning about the birds and the bees. So I, um, when I was writing my book, we did a whole thing about pleasure anatomy and how so few women understand, you know, what the clitoris, like the shape of the clitoris and clitoral stimulation. And there was all sorts of, um, you know, still a lot of mystery around women's orgasms. So I, I think that there, you know, we aren't taught about pleasure physiology because it isn't totally necessary for reproduction. So when you're in sex ed in seventh grade and then whatever sort of cursory stuff that you're learning, I don't know, in high school, maybe they touch on it again, no pun intended, um, you're, not, you're not really learning about pleasure. What you're learning about is sort of, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of, um, wow, the nuts and penises of, um, of reproduction. I don't even know where I read this, probably when I was researching for my book. Um, a woman's orgasm does help, in fact, to move the sperm along toward the egg. So there is some, you know, physiological reason why women have orgasm, but it is not necessary. So it is not something that is exactly like in the curriculum. 
So this idea of, of women's pleasure as being secondary is very important in this question about condoms because of the following. If sex is about man's experience, then a man will prioritize his own pleasure and not suggest a condom. She goes on, but how different is the pleasure of sex with a condom and without it? Let's imagine a physical pleasure scale where zero is neutral and 10 is maximum pleasure. A good massage lands us around five on the scale and an orgasm without a condom at 10. On this scale, where would sex with a condom fall? A seven, maybe an eight? So it's not that sex with a condom is not pleasurable, it's just not as pleasurable. An eight instead of a 10. I mean, you guys, I read that and I was like, I just, my, the whole thing shifted for me. Like ever since I was young, ever since I was a small child, um, you know, I've been like just, Ugh, like condoms, oh my God, it's like wearing a raincoat in the shower. I mean, just who knows where this shit came from. But so the, it's like this, this, this like thing about how awful they're, it's literally as if they're painful somehow, when in fact she's making this argument that like, it's still so pleasurable. Like it's still so great. And I have had a lot of success using this because um, this argument, you can have this discussion very briefly. I'll just be like, oh my God, you know, like women's birth control is a real burden and condoms are really convenient. And that's when everyone goes, oh yeah, but I mean condoms, I mean, ugh, condoms. And that's when you hit them, you'd be like, okay, yeah, um, a condom may make sex like slightly less pleasurable, but it's still not awful. It's still great. Like, what is that, you know? I mean, you can have an experience as a man, you go down the bodega, you get your condom, you have a great like physical experience, very pleasurable, eight out of 10, better than a massage, according to Gabrielle's uh, scale here. And that's it. Like, you know, it costs you, I don't know, a couple dollars and you th it's neat and tidy. You throw it in the waste paper basket, not in the toilet, um, but so you, you know, whatever, totally a non-event. You don't have side effects, you don't have to plan, you don't have to do any of these things. You've had this incredibly pleasurable experience, maybe a, an eight out of a 10, but apparently if you figure it out, it's a 10 out of 10 or very close to it, it's a 9.75 or something. And that would free, in fact, the woman in the partner, I mean, in the, in the sex situation to really not, um, you know, not have to worry about this. By the way, it's very important to note here that Gabrielle and I both, um, in these cases, I am talking about like very heteronormative sex between a cis woman and a cis man. And like, a, this is a very kind of patriarchal conversation. I like to think I'm pushing against the patriarchy, but it is very important to note that as I am doing that, I'm, I'm leaving out many, many people um, who, who either don't need birth control because they're not at risk of procreating, um, but also all sorts of different people. Um, but I do think that it's very important to, to have this discussion in, you know, under the auspices of what the hell are we doing about abortion? Um, that, that may be a very easy answer for this is condoms. And also maybe uh, women could maybe share the burden for some of the reproductive, uh, you know, weight that we carry. Okay, she goes on and says, when men choose to have condomless sex, they're putting a woman's body, health, social status, job, economic status, relationships, and even her life at risk in order to experience a few minutes of slightly more pleasure. It's horrible to type it out. It is, it is. So I'm actually gonna leave it there. I was gonna go through a few more of the arguments she makes and um, they're excellent. And I would, uh, you absolutely must read this book. It's so little and you can just, you know, buy it and leave it on your coffee table. Just buy a few extra copies and just like leave them lying around in different places. People, uh, you know, people are a little bit shocked, but they are drawn to it. And then they open it and it's so appealing because it's got these big announcements um, that are really thought provoking and really excellent. But I want to close on, on a somewhat more serious note, which is, you know, there's a little levity and there's a little humor in this whole discussion for me. Um, I'm not even sure why, it's probably not appropriate. Um, but, I, but I will say that it's a really, really serious issue because of the state of abortion in this country. So if, if we are talking um, about abortion, any conversation we have about abortion, Gabrielle Blair is absolutely right that we really need to get the men in this conversation. 
So in, in our discussion today, I have mostly focused just on this notion of men as like shouldering some of the responsibility for birth control, in part to make women's lives easier. But it is really important to remember that, that she's making a slightly wider argument. It isn't simply just that women should have to go through all of this pain and risk these side effects when there is a very easy answer. And, and in fact, I will argue that our nation, which is doing a really shitty job of a lot of things, has done a pretty good job of making some real strides in terms of talking about uh, sexual identity and sexual preference and, and gender and sex. And, and, and I, I really like to think that there's room for having these discussions about condoms and for really shifting, um, you know, th this, this really pervasive and really noxious and terrible uh, and, and really um, entrenched idea of, of condoms as making men somehow less manly or less virile or less of a conquistador or whatever, however you want to think about it. But I, I do think it's very important to shift that dialogue. But I also think it's very important to really look at this idea of condoms and, and look at men, um, whether it's a condom or a vasectomy, look at men as, um, you know, as a very important issue when we are thinking about abortion. All abortion conversations tend to really just focus on women and their bodies. And yes, on some level, that makes a lot of sense. On another level, we really need to go back to the idea that I think I'll leave you with that Gabrielle makes very persuasively, which is that every single unwanted pregnancy begins with a man. So I'm gonna leave you with that. Read Gabrielle Blair's book, check out Design Mom. Um, oh my gosh, you guys, it's the coolest thing. She lives in France. They're redoing this incredible, um, it, it's, oh my God, I can't get enough of the social media stuff. It's this incredible, like kind of farmhouse in, in France and they're they're very like crafty DIY types. So they're like, I don't even, like I would never do that stuff, but I love, like I can sit for hours clicking through like pictures of her adorable husband, Ben, like sawing, like, I don't know, centuries old French, you know, stones and like making a new bathroom or whatever they're up to. And they have six kids who are just so, they're Mormon. They have six kids who are like, just so interesting and and doing all sorts of cool stuff and they also are very like design oriented and so th there's just lots of like interesting and very compelling stuff her husband ben blair so cute he also um it, i mean cute sounds a little patronizing but he's done this very important thing and has made this university that is um it's online and it is tuition free and people can go and get all sorts of different degrees and they just got accredited it's very cool I'm forgetting the name right now, but I will put it up for you. You're gonna see it below me on the screen. I, I'm, I'm gonna guess right now. I think it's like Newland or I don't know. We'll see if I got it right. Okay, get this book, get ejaculate responsibly, um, you know, practice. Get out there with the condoms, practice. And um, happy reading.